In Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul wrote, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. He also declared in 2 Corinthians 11.4, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. From the early days of the Christian church, the simplicity of the gospel has been under a relentless attack from those who have tried to pervert and corrupt it with the filthy works of man. From the Judaizers and their damnable circumcision doctrine, to the Roman Catholics and their faith plus works heresy, from the satanic pseudo-Christian cults to the propagators of Lordship Salvation. The perversion of the gospel by the emissaries of Satan has damned untold millions to the lake of fire. In this documentary, we will contrast the true gospel of grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone with those being propagated by the devilish cults and the heretical false teachers who are embedded within the evangelical church. This will be an unapologetic defense of justification by faith alone, the most important doctrine in the Christian faith, and it will also be a no-holds-barred expose of those who would seek to overthrow the faith of the brethren with their damnable works righteous doctrine. Jude exhorted believers to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, and contend we will. Our subject matter? Another Gospel. Hi, I'm Mark Sennett. I've heard it said that when bank tellers are being trained, they become so familiar with the real thing that when a counterfeit comes their way, they can spot it immediately. That is exactly how it should be with those of us who are Christians. We ought to know the gospel so well that when someone comes along spouting a false gospel, we'll be able to tell it immediately. Now, this is an area that I fell down in several years ago because I allowed myself to come under the influence of men who were preaching a false gospel. It was subtle but it was false. Not all counterfeits are alike. Some counterfeits you can see a mile away, while others, others you really have to listen to, you really have to study to see what is being said because it sounds so close to the real thing. So that's what we're gonna look at right now. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the heart of the gospel, which is justification by faith alone, and then we're gonna compare that with all the other false gospels out there. And you will see that the one thing all of these false gospels have in common is works. They don't believe in Jesus alone. They believe in Jesus plus something that you have to do. So let's get started. Let's look at justification by faith alone and then compare that with all the other false gospels out there. The most important doctrine in the New Testament, and for that matter, in the entire Bible, is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. The sin of Adam has been passed down to every person who's ever lived. Romans 5 verse 12 and verses 17 through 19. And the scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, makes clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 9, verse 23, and Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20. In our sinfulness, we can do nothing to please God, because all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64 6 no good works that we do no matter how pious they may seem can ever make us right before a holy and righteous God and the Bible is clear if we break one of God's commandments then we've broken them all James chapter 2 verse 10 we must be perfect from the moment we are born till the moment we die in order for us to be accepted into God's kingdom so how can fallen men be forgiven of their sins and be made right before their Creator? The answer to that question 
is the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth. The sinless Son of God came to this earth over 2,000 years ago, and he lived the perfect life that we could not live. He was arrested, crucified on a cross, died, was buried, and three days later, he arose triumphantly from the grave and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. On the cross, the Lord Jesus took the sins of the entire world upon himself, 1 John 2, verse 2. And Isaiah 53, 5 says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Jesus did not die for himself because he had no sin in him, but he died as a substitute for sinful man. One of the most important scriptures having to do with the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ for sinners is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Our Lord's substitutionary death is also spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Jesus' precious blood was a ransom price, which was paid to satisfy the claims of a holy and righteous God. So, justification by faith alone is God declaring those who receive Jesus Christ as Savior as righteous. When sinners receive Christ by faith and by faith alone, they are immediately justified, declared righteous by God. At the moment of belief in what the Son of God has done for us, His righteousness will be imputed to our account, and we will be clothed in His righteousness. Because as believers, we are in Christ, Colossians 3.3, God sees Christ's righteousness when He looks at us. So then, Jesus Christ Himself is the object of our faith, it is only a resurrected and risen Christ who can save us. Once a person has been justified, declared righteous by God, there is nothing else that he needs to do in order to gain entrance into heaven. Pre-salvation works contributed nothing to our salvation, so post-salvation works contributes nothing to keeping us saved. It is all of Christ, from start to finish, and all we are called to do is believe. Simply believe. John 3.16 and Romans 1 verse 16. Thus, believers are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works. See Acts 13 verse 39, Romans 3 verses 21 through 28, Romans 4.5, Romans 5.1, Romans 10.4, Romans 11.6, Galatians 2 verse 16, Galatians 3 verses 10 through 14, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, Titus chapter 3 verse 5 and many other scriptures. As a matter of fact, there are over 160 verses in the New Testament that demonstrate that our salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The Holy Spirit could not make this essential point any clearer. Now, biblical Christianity rests on faith alone, and that is what separates it from every other religious system on planet Earth. Every false religion apart from Biblical Christianity teaches human achievement, and those who go that way will be condemned to the lake of fire. Also, as stated earlier, the Apostle Paul made clear in 2 Corinthians 11.4 that there is another Jesus, another Spirit, and another Gospel, and he pronounced anathema on all those in the church who preached a false gospel of works, Galatians 1 verses 8 and 9. Sadly. Many of the biggest names in the evangelical church are doing just that, mixing faith plus works, which is another gospel, and the doctrine of Rome, and they're damning themselves and those who accept their false and satanic teachings to the lake of fire. We will take a closer look at those false teachers when we get to the section on Lordship Salvation. So, we must be faithful. We must preach a gospel free of works, and one that points sinners to the finished work of Christ. We must not, no, we cannot go wrong on this most essential of truths, because if we abandon justification by faith alone, then we abandon the heart of the gospel and the only way of salvation that God has provided for us to be right with Him. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is the gift, 
And all we are called to do is simply believe. Just like the thief on the cross in Luke chapter 23 verses 42 and 43 and the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 31. Faith alone, in Christ alone, to be saved, apart from any works. That is justification by faith alone. Biblical Christianity teaches that the only way sinners can be forgiven by Almighty God is for them to be clothed in the righteousness of His sinless Son, Jesus Christ. Every pseudo-Christian cult rejects that essential truth, and they are built on the delusion that their works will merit them salvation when they stand before Him at the moment of death. However, in Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15, we see the frightful picture of sinners standing before God at the great white throne judgment, and twice in those five verses we are told that they will be judged according to their works. They will be found guilty because they will not be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and they will be thrown in the lake of fire for all eternity. So pseudo-Christian cults believe in Jesus plus works, but the Bible teaches Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Our holy and righteous God will not accept the filthy rags of sinners, and to say that our works can contribute to our salvation is to call God a liar and to spit on the sacrifice of His precious Son. Now, the largest pseudo-Christian cult on the planet is the Roman Catholic Church. It has over one billion members, and its entire theology is antichrist from the word go. Rome is unapologetic in its belief that sinners are justified in the eyes of God by faith and works, and the Council of Trent pronounces anathema on anyone who teaches justification by faith alone. Rome's entire theology is a rejection of the finished work of Christ on the cross, John 19.30. From the Mass to transubstantiation, from purgatory to indulgences, from praying to dead saints to praying to Mary, the entire system is designed to keep its gullible and deceived followers in the dark concerning the true gospel of grace, and they have been conned into thinking that there is no salvation outside the Roman Church. Rome preaches a false Jesus a false spirit, and a false gospel. There is no salvation in that antichrist system, and we must treat Roman Catholics as a mission field instead of looking at them as brethren, as many deceived and Bible-ignorant Christians have done. Like the Roman Catholics, Mormons preach a different Jesus, and they are works righteous down to their fingertips. Their Jesus is a spirit brother of Lucifer, and according to them, the true gospel was lost from the earth, but Mormonism is its restoration. Their gospel consists of laws and ordinances. They believe that Jesus paid for our sins in the Garden of Gethsemane, that we must be baptized and obey all the commandments, that good works are necessary for salvation, and that there is no salvation without accepting Joseph Smith as a prophet of God. As a matter of fact, Spencer W. Kimball, the church's twelfth president, wrote in the book Miracle of Forgiveness that one of the most fallacious doctrines originated by Satan and propounded by man is that man is saved alone by the grace of God. That belief in Jesus Christ is all that is needed for salvation. Mormonism rejects justification by faith alone, and its 15 million followers will burn in the lake of fire if they do not repent, that is, change their minds and put their faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was a created being, that he was Michael the Archangel who became a man, that there is no trinity, that Jesus was born again, that Jesus did not die on a cross but on a stake, that only their church members will be saved, that the soul ceases to exist after death, that there is no hell fire where the wicked are punished, that only 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses are born again, that salvation is by faith in what you do, and that it is possible to lose your salvation. Needless to say, justification by faith alone is nowhere to be found in their bankrupt, wicked, and satanic theology. They will burn. Seventh-day Adventists believe that our sins will ultimately be placed on Satan, that Jesus is Michael the Archangel, that worship must be done on Saturday, that the dead do not exist anymore, 
that the wicked are annihilated, that in 1844 Jesus entered the second and last phase of his atoning work, and that there is a sanctuary in heaven where Jesus carries out his mediatorial work. SDA is a false and satanic system that has damned millions and will continue to damn millions to the lake of fire. Oneness Pentecostals believe that you must be baptized by one of their ministers and that baptism is a necessary part of salvation. If you are not baptized, you cannot be saved. Also, you must be baptized in Jesus' name instead of in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They also teach that speaking in tongues is a necessary manifestation of the Holy Spirit and that those who do speak in tongues demonstrate that they are saved and have the truth. They are work salvation devils. Christadelphians teach that Jesus had a sin nature, that Jesus needed to save himself before he could save us, and that baptism is necessary for salvation. They deny that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. They deny that Jesus is God in the flesh. They deny the substitutionary atonement of Christ. They deny the Trinity. They deny the existence of hell and eternal punishment and they deny that a person exists after death. They are lost, lost, lost. The list of pseudo-Christian cults and their heresies could go on and on. But one thing is clear. They all reject grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to be saved. They're looking to their filthy rags to save them, instead of throwing themselves on the mercy of the Son of God, who paid for all of our sins on Calvary's tree. The way is narrow indeed. Now, let's take a look at some of the biggest names in Christendom who are preaching a false gospel under the heading of Lordship Salvation. It is much more subtle, but it is nothing more than the Romish doctrine of faithless works masquerading in evangelical garb. Lordship Salvation, which springs from Calvinism's perseverance of the saints, is the unsupportable belief that the performance of good works, the promise of good works, or the evidence of good works must accompany faith in Christ in order to make that faith result in eternal life. The proponents of this doctrine, many of whom are also Arminians, say that they believe in faith alone to be saved, but we will see that that is just not the case. It is a dangerous, self-righteous, and condemning doctrine, and it often makes hypocrites out of those who propagate it and those who are caught up in its net. It also destroys any assurance that a believer may have after being saved, because like a hamster on a wheel, they go around and around, always looking to their works as a test to see whether or not they are truly saved, but never knowing if they have done enough to secure their salvation. In reality, Lordship salvation is nothing more than the damnable Roman Catholic doctrine of faithless works, and it destroys the clear line between justification by faith, which happens the moment a sinner believes the gospel, and sanctification, which is a lifetime process of being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Lordship advocates routinely accuse those who reject their doctrine as being in favor of antinomianism, which is the belief that there are no moral laws God expects Christians to obey but that is just not the case. We do believe that we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, and that holiness is what the Bible expects from us, 1 Peter 1 16. But we believe that the gospel of grace is perverted and destroyed when sinners are told that works of submission and obedience are required for them to be saved, that is front-loading the gospel, and then they are told that they must persevere in good works as proof that they have truly believed. That is backloading the gospel, which is no gospel at all. Simply put, Lordship Salvation is not salvation at all, but man-made probation. A disbelief in God's word which clearly states that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 and Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. Lordship advocates also charge their opponents with believing in so-called cheap grace, or easy believism. But in the scriptures, grace is not only cheap, it's free, or it would not be grace. See Romans 5.15. Likewise, believing on Christ is not hard to do, 
because that's all we can possibly do. Romans chapter 4 verse 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Contrary to the Lordship advocates and their work-centered theology, salvation is pictured as simply looking, Isaiah 45, 22, coming, Matthew 11, 28, receiving, John chapter 1, verse 12, eating, John chapter 6, verse 51, drinking, John chapter 7, verse 37, trusting, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and taking, Revelation 22, verse 17. Many Lordship advocates also deny that a person can be a carnal Christian, but that is precisely what the Apostle Paul called the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and verses 3 and 4. As a matter of fact, that church was the most worldly church in the New Testament, and yet, Paul called them brethren over 18 times in the book. The fact is, believers have two natures, the fleshly nature and the spiritual nature. And the Apostle Paul wrote about them both in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. Lordship advocates also redefine the meaning of the words repent and faith. Repent simply means a change of mind, but they redefine it to mean turn from sin, which is a work. And worst of all, they ask unbelievers to do precisely that before coming to Christ. Unbelievers do not have the power to turn from sin and the scriptures simply ask them to believe the gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and Acts chapter 16 verse 31. The word faith is also redefined to mean obedience. Works are added to it, but that is false. Real faith is simply believing, period. See John chapter 2 verse 22, John chapter 4 verse 50, John chapter 20 verse 31, and many other scriptures. If a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, Romans 3 verse 28, then conduct, works, performance, obedience cannot be a part of faith. So the Lordship Salvation Gospel can be recognized by such statements as, repent of sin, make a commitment to Christ, be willing to follow Christ, or become a Christ follower. An unyielding commitment to obey Christ is needed. Also, the sinner must fulfill the demands of discipleship or at least be willing to fulfill them in order to have eternal life. And that is one of their biggest errors. Lordship Salvationists confound salvation, which costs nothing and which happens in an instant, with discipleship, which is an ongoing process. The true gospel that sets us free is not what I do for God. It is what God has done for me. Salvation is a free gift, not a loan paid back by good works. Now, who are the propagators of this heretical, bankrupt, and damnable doctrine? Well, the list is extremely long, but some of the biggest names are Pastor John MacArthur, my former pastor and the undisputed king of Lordship Salvation, and the man who has influenced more pastors and lay people on the subject than anyone else. MacArthur has a worldwide radio ministry. He is the president of the Master's Seminary in the Master's College. He's a prolific author and a popular conference speaker so his influence is felt in every area of Christendom. MacArthur's most well-known book, and also his most controversial, is The Gospel According to Jesus. It is a defense of Lordship Salvation, and it is considered the Lordship Bible by many. Most of the preachers and teachers today who propagate Lordship Salvation spout the same unbiblical and heretical ideas found in that book. Men such as Paul Washer, probably the most condemning and self-righteous of the bunch. Francis Chan, author of Crazy Love, David Platt, author of Radical, John Piper, R.C. Sproul, Tim Conway of I'll Be Honest, Kyle Adelman, author of Not a Fan, Kirk Cameron, Ray Comfort, Todd Friel, Phil Johnson, who edits all of MacArthur's books, Steve Lawson, James White, and a host of other well-known pharisaical fruit inspectors have decided to set themselves up as the judges and gatekeepers of heaven by deciding who has brought forth enough fruit in their lives to merit the glories of heaven. These men all speak out of the both sides of their mouths. They will say that we are saved by faith alone, but then in the next breath say that if fruit is not noticeable in a person's life, then they are either false converts or they were never saved to begin with. How much fruit does a person need to bring forth in order to prove that they are really saved? 
the self-righteous fruit inspectors never say. But the twisting of scriptures like Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23 and 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 are used to justify their bankrupt and works righteous theology. Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 through 23 is about judging the doctrine of false prophets and that passage has absolutely nothing at all to do with judging a believer's salvation. The false prophets trusted in their works to be saved instead of the finished work of Christ. Just read the passage, it's all right there, and they will be damned to the lake of fire for it. See Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15. Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 is also a favorite of Lordship Salvationist. They point to the phrase, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith, and then say that we must look to see if we have brought forth enough fruit in our lives to see if we are saved. But the context of that passage has to do with the Corinthians questioning Paul's apostleship, when in reality they were the proof of his apostleship. It was through him that they were led to the Savior. If they wanted to see his credentials, they should look at themselves. So the proof of Paul's authority is that Jesus Christ is in them. Paul also had no doubt about their salvation, because all throughout the epistles of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he calls them brethren over and over again. Paul was not an irrational and double-minded preacher. He would not tell the believers in Rome and Galatia that they were justified by faith, but then tell the Corinthians to look at their works to see if they are saved. Paul was no work salvationist. Also, if we were to examine several people in the Holy Bible, their works would seem to condemn them as false believers, but they were soundly saved. Lot was a judge in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the last time we read about him in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 19, he is in a cave, drunk, sleeping with and impregnating his two daughters. But Peter tells us that Lot was a just and righteous man, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Samson was a fleshly man all the days of his life, but he is listed in the Hall of Faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. King David committed adultery, impregnated Bathsheba, and then killed her husband Uriah to cover up his sins. But David is referred to as a man after God's own heart in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Solomon, David's son, was a serial polygamist. He also served the abominable gods of his foreign wives, and he even erected an idol to Molech, which was for child sacrifice. That's 1 Kings chapter 11. However, the book of Ecclesiastes records Solomon's testimony and his subsequent change of mind. See chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. Solomon was a believer when he did all of those wicked acts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we read about a man who was sleeping with his father's wife, and he was subsequently disciplined by the church, but he was still considered a brother. See 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The list could go on and on, but if the modern-day, self-righteous, lordship proponents were living in those days, they would have condemned all of those men to the lake of fire for their works but they were saved, as scripture clearly testifies. By the way, Judas Iscariot did more works than most Christians will ever do, but he was a lying, thieving, hypocritical son of Satan who is currently in hell. The scribes and the Pharisees also did a lot of works, and most of the people in Israel were fooled by those works, but our Lord unmasked them for the fools, hypocrites, blind guides, serpents, vipers, and sons of the devil that they truly were. See Matthew chapter 23 and John chapter 8. Now, MacArthur says that he believes in faith alone, but his book is all about works and fruit inspecting. In his book, MacArthur says that believing the facts about the gospel is not enough to be saved, and so does every other lordship salvationist. Funny, the Roman Catholic Church says the exact same thing. Scripture, on the other hand, says differently. See Acts 16:31, Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. He suggests that works must be understood as part of faith, and so does every other lordship salvationist. According to them, anything less than total commitment is just not saving faith. Works, works, works. MacArthur talks about full surrender to the lordship of Christ. Full surrender, of course would be nothing less than sinless perfectionism. He says that the non-lordship position warps and sometimes completely destroys the gospel. It's the other way around. 
there is no gospel in lordship salvation. You're put back under the law, hoping that your works will be salvific enough at the point of death. And he says about the non-lordship position, it is a distinctly different view of salvation than the biblical one. Lordship salvation is far from biblical. It is straight from the pit of hell, along with the tulip doctrine that most lordship salvation is propagate. I could go on and on listing the heresies in MacArthur's wicked book, but you get the picture. In his book, Grace Unknown, R.C. Sproul says, Endurance and faith is a condition for future salvation. Only those who endure in faith will be saved for eternity. Again, works, works, works. Another lordship heretic is John Piper. In his book, What Jesus Demands from the World, he says, There is no doubt that Jesus saw a measure of real, lived-out obedience to the will of God as necessary for final salvation. And again, what God will require at the judgment is not our perfection, but sufficient fruit to show that the tree had life, in our case, divine life. So according to him, it will not be us clothed in the righteousness of Christ that will be the determining factor as to whether or not we gain entrance into heaven, but sufficient fruit in our lives. That is heresy. In his book, Not a Fan, Kyle Adelman says, Biblical belief is more than mental assent or verbal acknowledgement. Many fans have repeated a prayer or raised their hand or walked forward at the end of a sermon and made a decision to believe, but there was never commitment to follow. Jesus never offered such an option. He is looking for more than words of belief. He is looking to see how those words are lived out in your life. When we decide to believe in Jesus without making a commitment to follow him, we become nothing more than fans. That entire sentence could have been written by a Roman Catholic priest, and his book is filled with lordship trash like that. Ottoman wants more than a simple belief in order for a sinner to be saved. So does the harlot of Rome. Francis Chan, who graduated from MacArthur's seminary, says, Put simply, failing to help the poor could damn you to hell. If you are in Jesus Christ, you will not go to hell because you did not help the poor. Francis Chan is a rank work salvationist. Paul Washer, whose works righteous heresies have been thoroughly documented, says, Salvation is by faith alone. It is a work of God. It is a grace upon grace upon grace. But, now get ready for his double talk and dose of works. The evidence of conversion is not just your examination of your sincerity at the moment of your conversion. It is ongoing fruit in your life. It is ongoing fruit in your life. So let me see if I get this straight. Salvation is by faith alone, but I must examine my fruits to see if I'm saved. What is the difference between this statement and what Rome teaches? And how much fruit must we produce in our lives in order for us to know if we're saved or not? He doesn't tell us, because he doesn't know. Paul Washer is a Romanist. The other Lord Shippers, Conway, Platt, White, Johnson, Lawson, Friel, Comfort, Cameron, and the rest of them are all singing from the same songbook, and it would be redundant for me to quote them all, because they're all saying the same things. Listening to just a few of their sermons will make you vomit. The self-righteousness of these fruit-inspecting and condemning Pharisees is unbearable, and no wonder multitudes of born-again Christians lack assurance in their Christian lives. Men like these sow doubt upon doubt because they make you feel like you're not doing enough and you're put under bondage and legalism by their teachings. All these lordship teachers are nothing more than poison dressed up as desserts. A teacher writing on lordship salvation said this, Every action is judged. You're not looking at the cross, you're looking at your walk. You've been trained to inspect the fruit in your own life, so you naturally inspect the fruit or lack thereof in others. You cannot help but find fault and condemn others for their lack of obedience. The more faults you find in others, the more faults you find in yourself. And since you doubt your own salvation in one level, you postulate that others might not be saved because they're not obeying that well either. You reason within yourself that others must not have truly believed 
or must have had a false conversion because they lack obedience. Lordship Salvationists have redefined the gospel to include both belief and a commitment to obediently follow Christ, which they can't live up to, and somehow judging others where they appear more obedient gives them the measure of assurance they so desperately seek. Lordship salvation is another gospel. Galatians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9. It is a denial of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works to be saved. And those who teach it are condemned and on their way to the lake of fire, if they do not repent, that is, change their minds. Romans chapter 11 verse 6 says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. If you've been seduced by wicked and self-righteous teachers into believing that false and hell-damning doctrine, stop listening to them. Throw their satanically inspired books and CDs in the nearest garbage bin where they rightfully belong, and rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 through 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The eternal security of the believer is one of the most precious and comforting doctrines in all of Scripture, because it declares that all those who have placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save them are eternally secure and cannot be lost. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, takes up residence in our lives the moment we are justified, declared righteous by God, and we are from that moment on children of the living God, forgiven forever, never to have our sins brought up before the Father. It is a comforting doctrine because we are told by the Good Shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. We're also members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. It is a comforting doctrine because he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6 Our security is based on the faithfulness of Christ, not on our obedience, conduct, performance, good works, or perseverance. Sadly, the majority of those who have fallen for false gospels like Lordship Salvation have no assurance of salvation because their faith is centered not on the finished work of Christ but on their ongoing obedience to God. On one hand, the Calvinists say that ongoing good works is proof that a person is one of the elect, while on the other hand, the Arminians say that ongoing good works prove that a person is still saved. Either way, the burden of proof is put on the shoulders of the believer and not on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. They are both from the pit. Listen to the words of the Apostle John. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. We can know that we have eternal life if we simply believe on Jesus Christ. No works involved. Just believe. See Romans chapter 4, verse 5, Romans chapter 10, verse 4, and Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Our High Priest in Heaven is at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 And as a captain of our salvation, it is He who will bring us to glory. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 
we are safe and secure in the arms of our Savior. Anyone who rejects the eternal security of the believer rejects justification by faith alone, and they are on the works highway to Rome. Finally, some of the most comforting verses on eternal security can be found in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. They read as follows. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Faith alone. So, if you're listening to anyone, any big name preacher who tells you that believing in Jesus Christ is not enough to be saved, you're under the influence of devils. Run for the front door. The equation is very simple. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. If you add anything to Jesus, it's a false gospel, and it is a damnable gospel, and you will go straight to hell. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you truly believe in Him and what He did on Calvary's cross, His death, burial, and resurrection, that He died for you on Calvary's cross, if you truly do believe that, and you believe that He was raised again on the third day, if you have faith and faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. It's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Anyone who tells you differently, no matter who they are, whether it's MacArthur, whether it's Washer, Piper, White, um, Sproul, any one of these guys, anyone anyone who tells you that it's not believing alone, you got to believe and do certain things, they're devils, they're liars, don't listen to them, run for the front door, okay? Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. It's faith alone, faith alone in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe only, and you shall be saved. God bless. Hey guys, I just wanted to make um, a correction on something that I said a few days ago on, um, on my latest video on another gospel, uh, dealing with the different gospels and also Lordship Salvation. A brother um, brought to my attention that I had uh, made it seem as if um, that every single person out there, all the Lordship Salvation teachers out there, are condemned to the lake of fire. And um, I was wrong in doing so, and I should not have done so. Um, he made a very good point that many of them could uh, could be deceived themselves. You know that at one point they may have believed the true gospel of uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, apart from any works. But they may have been deceived at uh, some way along the line, and um, now they're caught up into heresy. And um, if they truly did believe at one point, if they were truly one of the Lord's um, children at one point, that, that they are still saved. Um, they're going to lose their rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, you know, and they could also be chastised uh, down here, but they are still saved. And I agree with that. You know, I was um, in my zeal to condemn that doctrine, which should be condemned because it's a false, um, it's a false doctrine. I... Um, pretty much condemned um, all those teachers of the lake of fire and I should not have done so. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. I want, I want to see people saved. And so I was, um, I was wrong in, um, in saying that and, um, and I need to publicly correct myself and um, thank that brother for, uh, for correcting me. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works. No pre-salvation works or post-salvation works will contribute to our salvation. It's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is how we are justified. Yes, 
after we are saved, the process of sanctification will begin. We will be um, conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's a lifetime process, all right? And for many Christians, you're going to see a lot of fruit. And for some Christians, um, you're not going to see almost no fruit from them. I mean, the fruit was pro will probably be there, but it's going to be very hard to see. But that's not what our salvation is based on. Our salvation is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, apart from any works. So, if any Lordship Salvation teacher out there um, did believe the gospel at one point, but now because of um, whatever, they may have been uh, deceived by someone and now they themselves are teaching heresy, um, they're still saved, but they're going to be chastised and they are going to lose their rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And, um, and we should warn people about them and we should um, have nothing to do with them, okay? We should excommunicate them and we should have nothing to do with them, but warn our brother, brothers and sisters about the false, um, false gospels that they're preaching, all right? But if they were truly one of the Lords, if they truly did believe the gospel at one point, but now they're caught up into heresy. They're still safe, but they're going to be, um, they're going to lose their rewards, as I said, and they're going to be chastised by by the Lord. I don't have the right to condemn anybody to hell, and so if I, um, if that's how it came across in my video, I really do apologize for that, and, um, and I thank the brother for his correction on that, all right? So let's keep the gospel um, pure from works, okay? It's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any works, all right? It's all Jesus and none of us. God bless.